It is my pleasure to welcome you back to the third and final uh, plenary panel discussion of the Oslo Red Exchange. I trust that uh, we're all energized by the signing ceremony and by Secretary Kerry's remarks. And I encourage everyone who's still outside to please come on in. We have a, a really great panel um, before we close the, the conference formally. The purpose of this panel is really twofold, is to um, share some more high-level reflections about the state of play on the forests and climate change agenda uh, more broadly and the Red Plus uh, agenda specifically, both based on uh, experience to date and what we've learned over the past two days at this conference. But secondly, to really focus on the, you know, the post-conference agenda in terms of what's next, what are the priorities, where do we go from here? And I'm very pleased that I'm joined by such a distinguished panel that I think will give us some real uh, a broad variety uh, of perspectives on those two questions. To my immediate left is His Excellency Rafael Trotman, who is the Minister of Natural Resources from Guyana. Uh, to his left is Jonathan Pershing, who has just recently been named the United States Special Envoy for Climate Change. And you may have noticed that when Secretary Kerry mentioned that you know some of you have been working on the Paris Agreement for decades, he looked down at Jonathan. You know, so so this is the guy. Um, I also to his left is Joenia Waipichana. Joenia is with the Indigenous Council of Rarema, which is in the Amazon region of Brazil. And last but not least, Lars Lavold, who is the Executive Director of the Rainforest Foundation Norway, right here in Oslo. So, I'd like to start out by uh, posing a question to Minister Trotman. And first of all, let me congratulate you on the celebration of the 50th anniversary of Guyana's Thank independence you. just Thank two you. weeks ago. <laughs> so the other night you, you conveyed to me that actually while everybody who grows up in Guyana has a special affinity for the forest, you actually didn't really get into the green heart of Guyana until about green 15 heart. years ago, yeah? The green That's heart true. of Guyana, green I guess, of Guyana. To, uh, to appreciate the forest. But I, what I want to ask you about is um, Guyana's journey on Red Plus. I mean, certainly your country was one of the first to um, start down this road, enter into an agreement with the Norwegians. And I, I wonder, you know, based on the years of experience, what reflections you have as a Red Plus pioneer, how you would describe the relative importance of the various factors that have led to progress? Is it presidential leadership? Is it international finance? Is it involving indigenous peoples in cons consultations and broad stakeholder participation? Um, and what, in that context, what advice would you give to other countries that are going down this road, and in particular, to other elected politicians who have to champion this agenda? Okay, well, thank you. Uh, great to be here. I'd like to uh, firstly thank the government and people of Norway for organizing this uh, fabulous exchange, bringing us all together. It has been uh, great over the last two days. Uh, with that said, um, what has contributed or what led to where we are? I would say D, all of the above, <laughs> in keeping with uh, our question and answer segment. Uh, yes, we've had, I believe, strong leadership. Uh, successive presidents have been very, very strong on the environment and protecting it and our forests. We've had good collaborations with uh, the international agencies and with countries such as Norway, and most importantly, our uh, relations um, within government and, of course, between government and the people. Of course, uh, I, I'm not here going to sit and say that it has all been perfect, but certainly we've managed to strike a good balance, uh, which is always a work in progress. So at the presidential level, I believe uh, the world knows uh, former President Barra Jagdio, he spearheaded much of the work that we inherited and most recently President David Granger, who came to office last year, has taken up the mantle and has now become Guyana's champion for the environment. And we use his vision to, to forge ahead and we are here in Norway, which has been our best and foremost partner in helping us to keep our forests at 85% uh, covered, and we are forging better relations with the 
people, the indigenous peoples who are the original protectors of the forest. So Guyana has done relatively well with Red Plus. At the same time, I should add that before Red Plus, we had also been doing a fairly good job of keeping our forests where they are, and we um, were somewhat disappointed that some of the financing, some of the expectations that we had did not materialize, but with the coming of the Paris Agreement, we believe that the world's vision is and view is now once again on Red Plus, and we are better able to understand what it is we have to do, where it is we have to go, and how it is we have to do it. Okay, thank you. I'll have some follow-up questions on of that course. in a moment. <laughs> so, Jonathan, in the interest of transparency for the rest of you, I should disclose that Jonathan and I were colleagues at the World Resources Institute about 10 years ago, and so I'm going to have to resist the urge to be too familiar in posing questions to a senior official of my government, but uh, I'll do my best. So, um, Jonathan, uh, we were certainly energized by Secretary Kerry's speech, but we haven't had a chance to actually read the declaration and, and what was in there. So it would be great if you could give us some highlights of what's in the declaration, why it's important, you know, what this means for, for Red Plus, and particularly why it's important in sort of a post-Paris world. So thanks very much, Francis. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you very much for moderating the session. It's always good to have friends moderate sessions because then you, you have some confidence they'll only ask you questions that you can answer. Uh, <laughs> she promised not to ask any hard ones later, and I'm going to hold her to it. Um, the, uh, but the, I think the question is really quite reasonable. I, ultimately, you saw the, the signing, but you really haven't had a chance to look at what we've been doing. There are, I think, a number of things that both the Secretary of State and the Minister of Norway noted in their remarks that really speak to what the agreement speaks to. The first one is to acknowledge the importance of forestry and the management of deforestation as part of the central solution to the climate change problem. Give or take some, a quarter of the global emissions are coming from this sector. How do we address our 80% or more reduction, get to two degrees or strive for 1.5 degrees without it is really virtually an impossibility. And both of them noted that and the agreement says the same thing. Both of them also spoke a bit to the private sector component, and the agreement speaks to that as well, and the framework of bringing in investment and finding ways to make it work for communities is not a top-down exercise. It's really, in some ways, a bottom-up exercise that draws from what we need to do to make this work at the individual, local, jurisdictional level. And there are a host of very specific er areas in which we intend to work. So this is not a new uh, partnership. We in Norway have been working on this, in fact, for some number of years already. Uh, this is an exercise that we are not only doing bilaterally, but which we've been joined in by a host of other countries around the world. This is kind of a continuation of that kind of an approach. And let me just tick off a few small pieces that I think are relevant and certainly were part of the discussion that you've all been having here. They were in the questions that you asked and the polling that people took. In many ways, in my mind, the kinds of things that we are working with them bilaterally on come very much out of the conversations that have been held in this Red Plus community now for several years. So the first one is this question really of supporting countries in developing inventories, monitoring, reporting, and verification systems. Ultimately, unless you have information, unless you have data, it's extraordinarily hard to take the next step of doing the planning and think about where you can be most effective. It's not the only thing, it's a precursor, it's one element, but it's a key point that we wanted to make in the agreement that we would work together to improve. The Global Forest Observation Initiative, for example, being one model where we can do that. A second area where we want to work is in the supply chain question. And for many of you, that's been a pretty central component of how do you think about not just the forests in uh, some abstract way, but where the commodities will be used, how you can address the entire chain and be effective at managing the end product, which then has a consequence in terms of the land and where it's moving. We're looking explicitly at strengthening the business case for sustainable investment. We will work with Norway in this agreement to enhance that things, for example, like the Tropical Forest Alliance 2020 to look at investment ready projects. How can we make this appealing and attractive so the alternatives to deforestation have real resonance and can provide community livelihoods? Can we invest and look at investment in sustainable land use? These kinds of questions certainly attach to that. 
there's going to be a transparency initiative, which is part of what we've been doing under the, uh, under the Paris Agreement that'll also fit into this. But as one component, we're looking at illegal logging and thinking through how to manage that in a better way and look at associated trade. And just to close, perhaps with a short anecdote, uh, my daughter is currently serving in Senegal and she's very near the border with Gambia. And the entire border area is being deforested and she's doing some work looking at that particular question. And it's being sold because it's legal to buy it in Gambia, even though it's illegal to log it in Senegal. And how do you think about that constraint? This illegal logging question is the kind of thing which we also have to worry about. And there's not one answer, there's not one solution. There are a host of different reasons, different drivers on the deforestation side. The effort that we're making bilaterally in this agreement is to work on many of those with Norway. Okay, thank you. So um, let me give you a warning that our next speaker will be addressing us in Portuguese. So if you, like me, will need translation, you might want to uh, get your headset prepared and uh, turned on. Um, I think Joania uh, gets the award for having endured the most arduous journey to be here with us because unfortunately her original flight was caught up in the Air France pilot strike and so um, her arrival was delayed and was wondering whether it was still worth coming because she was going to miss her appearance previously scheduled for plenary one to talk about national level implementation of Red Plus in particular in Brazil. But we encouraged her that, yes, please do get on another plane and come join us because we really do want to hear from you. And uh, she was graciously willing to do that. And I, I hope that uh, she's glad that, that she did so. So, Joania, you are an indigenous leader. You are a human rights lawyer. And you are a woman. Based on your unique, unique experience with those identities and your experience in Brazil, I'd like to invite you to give some reflections that address two questions. One is, how can indigenous communities, human rights, and women contribute to the success of efforts to reduce deforestation? And the other way around, how can Red Plus initiatives contribute to advancing the rights and well-being of indigenous peoples, and particularly women? Joania. Bom, é, primeiro, primeiro ponto, infelizmente, eu vou lembrar aqui uma situação bastante difícil que nós passamos hoje no Brasil. É, hoje é o dia de solidariedade ao assassinato da líder indígena Berta Cáceres, que muitos de vocês conheceram e que doou sua vida pela proteção das terras indígenas. E eu também gostaria de lembrar que eu estou me solidarizando como indígena da Amazônia, a família de uma liderança que foi assassinada ontem, ontem pela manhã, em relação a conflitos por terras no Mato Grosso do Sul, o líder Clododi, que é Guarani Caiová, na disputa sobre terras. Então, como direitos humanos, né, como advogada, a minha experiência tem visto muito desses desafios ainda que se prolongam por conta de ainda não termos ainda uma medida e mecanismos que protejam os direitos territoriais dos povos indígenas. É apesar né, do Brasil ter isso reconhecido na nossa Constituição Federal e ter estabelecido o dever institucional de proteger e fazer respeitar todos os bens ali existentes. Eu diria, nessa linha, que qualquer iniciativa, por exemplo, Red Mais, né, ele pudesse, que incide sobre territórios indígenas, ele pudesse, como ponto de partida, ter esse pressuposto, o reconhecimento dos nossos direitos direitos territoriais, direitos em relação aos direitos humanos dos povos indígenas. E como mulher, a colaboração das mulheres indígenas, elas, são, elas estão em evidência. Né? Nós vemos os esforços das nossas lideranças mulheres que têm tentado incluir nessa discussão, na pauta, seja no Rede Mais, como e no conjunto todo de mudanças climáticas, os seus valores, os valores que são 
é, ancestrais, os seus conhecimentos tradicionais, os manejos sustentáveis, a visão holística sobre a manutenção do direito da cultura, mas também sobre a questão da governança da floresta, a forma de manter uma floresta de, uma, de manejo é, sustentável e também incluir as práticas tradicionais, que essas, sim, contribuem né, justamente na proteção, mas também elas lidam, elas são responsáveis também pela segurança alimentar dos povos indígenas que estão ameaçados hoje face às mudanças climáticas. Eu diria assim, que ver os territórios indígenas, os povos indígenas, além da conservação, é também ver, ter essa visão como povos vulneráveis, como territórios vulneráveis. E tal como isso, precisam ter esse investimento de proteção e de participação. So, Jenny, I'm going to take the opportunity to ask a, a direct follow-up question because as you began speaking, you referred to the current political and economic crisis in Brazil as the, the broader context. And I just wonder, um, following on a, a whole discussion that, that we had uh, yesterday afternoon uh, focused on Brazil, if you wanted to make any comment about um, how this agenda may be compromised or, or if there's any concern about this particular moment, um, given the broader economic and political context. Realmente, nós passamos por um período difícil é, no Brasil, eu diria também em toda a parte né, onde os povos indígenas são povos vulneráveis. Né? Eu creio que uma participação é, na construção dessas políticas, na tomada de decisão em si, políticas que estabeleçam medidas claras, mecanismos claros, para começo de história, a proteção, o reconhecimento, ver a terra indígena como investimento, e povos indígenas como capazes de desenvolver a sua própria política através de acessos ao financiamento diretos, né, que estabeleçam essas, essas iniciativas próprias indígenas. Né. Alguns anos atrás, a gente via apenas como espectadores. Hoje, são atores de políticas né, que possam desenvolver suas proteções, seu monitoramento, é, suas boas práticas, enfim, levar esse exemplo bom para fora das terras indígenas. Ah, e, acima de tudo, não apenas medidas que reconheçam, mas que implementam direitos. Eu acho que esse é um ponto-chave, né, que nós precisamos sair apenas do reconhecimento, do respeito. Nós temos que utilizar palavras mais fortes e efetivas, garantia da efetivação e da implementação. Great, thank you. Very clear. So, Lars, you were one of the handful of people almost a decade ago who was advocating that the government of Norway undertake a major international initiative on forests and climate change. So, as you think back to the state of play a decade ago and what has happened in the interim, what you've heard over the last two days, what would you say about the current state of play of this enterprise of Red Plus that you helped get started 10 years ago? What would you say are the major achievements, the major remaining gaps, some of the major surprises, and maybe even reflections on the voting results about you know, what, what struck you about how a conference like this, a, the conversation has changed over that period? That's a comprehensive <coughs> four-part question. Yeah, just four minutes, is it? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Well, first of all, I must say uh, that uh, big achievement is that uh, when uh, Rainforest Foundation started working on the rainforest, it was like uh, maybe 10 people very interested in, in the issue, uh, and it has for a long time been uh, a concern of this sort of those concerned with something strange and, and uh, exotic. And we have seen today, and we have seen actually growing since Bali in December 2007, that the issue of uh, protecting the rainforest is a top-level political issue, high on the agenda of top politicians, high on the agenda increasingly of big businesses, uh, CEOs, etc. 
And I think when uh, Erna Solberg opened this session, she said that there is no sustainable future without the protection of tropical forests. And I think that puts the issue where it belongs. It is not a technical issue. It's not even a question of carbon. It's a question of changing the way we deal with development in forest-rich countries. Forests are disappearing, and they are disappearing for a reason, and we have to change those reasons. So it means that what is needed is a different development model, not really all those acronyms of RPINs and RPDs and whatnot. It is to give stimulus to those who protect the forest. Tasso Azevedo said in the Brazil session, there are some quick wins. Quick wins are government decisions. They can be implemented very rapidly. Almost all early red strategies on a national level identified unclear tenure as a challenge and a risk to, re to having long-term results in forest protection. So why is so little being done in reality? Uh, so that's a major gap. We have identified a key problem. We allow the whole process to postpone it. We don't deal with it. We don't put the money in the budgets for it. We keep doing investments in quite detailed and strong MRVs so that we can know how much carbon is emitted and how much carbon is saved. That may be very important in the future, but it's not what's going to protect the forest in the short term. We are really underestimating and sort of diverting the word for results-based payments to some future where we have like detailed knowledge about the carbon. Results-based payment is about rewarding progress. Progress is in making a good national plan. It's opening for participation. It's involving people. It's making the right institutions. It's doing tenure reform. If you do that, that's the result, and it should be rewarded. And we should not wait and put results-based payments for the future. So one of the big achievements of this whole thing, and that has been very clear in this session, is the very important role of indigenous people and traditional populations of the forest. In knowing the forest, in living there by the millions, and not having been ever rewarded for protecting it. So we have to really change the reward structure. And I think that is essential, and it's rapid, because the high-level political attention is still not being transformed into implementation on the ground. It's very slow. It's just frustratingly slow. Uh, and uh, one reason for that is because the rich countries do, don't do their part. There is a lack of political will in many forest countries, but there is certainly a very important lack of political will in the north. So, okay, so Norway has taken an international leadership role, it's a small country with five million people. So why are not these enormous countries with much bigger economies not stepping up to the plate? I don't know who you'd be talking about. Um, <laughs> I want to come back for a quick follow-up on an earlier point that you, met, you made about the, the in your view, um, disjuncture between the real need of dealing with tenure but all the attention being over here on MRV. Why do you think that's the case? What's your diagnosis of why that's why there's so little investment in resolving the tenure issues? Because in the beginning, there was an inflated vision of a billion dollar, trillion dollar carbon market, which many forceful uh, actors, uh, you know, were, they saw it coming and they wanted to prepare for it. But actually, uh, protecting forest is a socio-economic question. It's about, as I said, changing incentive structures. It's about involving the people. It's about rewarding those people who do a good job. And it's about law enforcement and cracking down on those who steal. And that was 
the first years in Brazil, the drastic reduction was done only by enforcing the laws and, well, adding on uh, what governments could do. They could create indigenous territories, they could create national parks. Uh, so that, that combination of government decision and cracking down on illegality was sufficient to um, basically halve the, the uh, deforestation rates in Brazil. Okay, so in terms of the, the scorecard on the points that Jonathan ticked off, not so excited about the MRV, but very supportive of the law enforcement uh, effort. And we saw the uh, scorecard on uh, linking red plus to real green development mm. uh, going up over these two days, and that's a good result. Mm. Good. Okay, uh, let's get back to you, um, Minister Trotman. Um, one of the things that was interesting in the, the voting questions earlier um, was about, you know, what, what has changed since Paris? You know, what's it, what is it that's in the Paris Agreement that might make a difference? And I noted in your first intervention, you said something about that, well, we've been disappointed on some of the finance, but now that we have Paris, you know, we, we think things are looking up. I want to press you a little bit on, on what you see coming out of Paris that will make a material difference uh, in Guyana. And maybe more generally, what would you say is the single most important thing that the international community, or maybe more specifically those rich countries that don't have the political will that, that uh, Lars was talking about, what can we do to support the efforts of governments like Guyana to implement their nationally determined contributions uh, post-Paris? Thank you. I think uh, those who were in Paris would, uh, would quickly have realized that the issue then was not about money. Though, of course, uh, Red Plus got into the final uh, draft, but it was more of an you know, existential issue. And we, we've all come around to the fact that there's money to be made, but this is not about that secondary. It's, it's about saving our forests and, by extension, saving our lives. And so that's the impetus that, I, that I'd like to refer to when I, when I speak about Paris. So, there was a, a kind of a rebirthing, uh, a resurgence of the idea of doing something right. We've, we've spent the last few hundred years uh, getting it wrong, and we've now come around to the acceptance that our forests are, are going to guarantee our, our very existence. So we heard today references from uh, Secretary uh, Kerry about the, you know, the glaciers in Greenland going at a very fast rate. So what happens in Greenland affects uh, our friend in Roraima, it affects us uh, in Guyana, it affects our friends in Indonesia and elsewhere. So we'd like to see that uh, coming together, that collaboration, that uh, joining of hearts and minds that we saw in Paris carry on. And, and as, like I said, money is a part of it and is a big part of it, but it's not the main part. The main part is working together and going forward. So how can the international community continue uh, to assist us? Well, we've had good support from, from countries, Norway, and uh, the, the US seems to be coming along. So we've, we've got to use our, that impetus to, to push them along and, uh, and, and bring them to. So yes, of course, offering rewards. I was about to say the carrot and the stick method, but let's not use the stick. Offering some good carrots uh, to countries that are making the effort, looking into issues of human rights to uh, recognize that there are people who are still literally dying uh, in fighting to preserve uh, their forests and their, their livelihoods, and ensuring that uh, there is an exchange of technology transfers and uh, we can monitor our forests better, that there are in the supply chain, the economics of it all. People are cutting forests. I think you, you mentioned your daughter's own experience because there's an opportunity across a river where it's illegal on this side, but on that side, it's quite legal and it, and it pays well. What opportunities can we uh, add so that people can turn their attention away from providing for firewood or for just putting a meal on the table? Sometimes it's a bowl of rice. Uh, the difference between starvation and, and life. So those countries that have the resources have to see it not just as, you know, we, 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 we're giving more, but really we're adding uh, value to a better, a better earth and a better world. So that's where I'd like to uh, put the focus. Well said. 
-hmm. Yes. So, Jonathan, yesterday, for those of us who were here in the morning, um, Eric Solheim, the incoming uh, head of UNEP, made a big point about how important it was that the Norwegian support for uh, the forest and climate agenda had uh, persisted through a change in political uh, administrations. And that that was, you know, given the long-term project that we we're engaged in, that that kind of continuity was a, a real significant point. And it just strikes me that probably I'm not the only one in the room who would really like to ask you about the implications of a certain event that's going to happen in the United States in November 8th uh, for this whole agenda and the possibility of uh, continuity or, or otherwise. But uh, assuming that you will refuse to answer that question, I'll also allow you to uh, comment on what's going to happen uh, starting on November 7th, which is when COP22 starts in Marrakesh as uh, a lead into drawing on your long and deep experience as a climate negotiator about where we can expect forests to go in uh, negotiations post Paris, uh, Marrakesh and beyond. And maybe also a chance to comment on, on this, the voting exercise we had about what is it that's in the Paris Agreement that you expect to be most important for supporting the, the, the forest agenda. So thanks very much. I, I would just note a couple of things about Paris that to me are, are central. The first one is that I, I see it in a series of, of discrete components, perhaps the most central of which was the target, which we've agreed collectively needs to be very, very ambitious and robust. And if we think about this particular sector, there's no model in which we reach the target without this sector making a contribution. The second point that I would make and the second big bucket in my mind that was in Paris was this bottom-up structure of commitments in which countries individually agree that they would take action. And those are formed in the, in the context of these nationally determined contributions. And on the order of 120 countries listed forest and land use in their nationally determined contributions. So it's independent in some sense of a top-down vision. It is really a national view about a priority that's been assigned to these issues. And then the third, and this is kind of a large bucket in the third, is in the support mechanism and the verification. And I, I put those a little, bit, a little bit together. They're not obviously quite the same thing. They're different components. But at one end, you want to understand what you can deliver properly. And at the other end, you want to provide support to make sure it happens. And if we look, for example, at the Green Climate Fund, there are specific language there that incorporates the use uh, of resources to go to the forestry sector. And I anticipate that will continue. And as we look at the donor community, there are also resources resources directly tied back into that. But it then brings me to two other, other questions. Will it continue? How do we see this unfolding post Paris? And to me, this is where the work of this group becomes most central. We're no longer negotiating in Paris the rules of red. We're no longer having a discrete conversation, and therefore there are two models, which, one of which I think is not likely, which is that it will fall off the radar because it's not being negotiated. And to me, the more likely model is we will now turn to the implementation phase. And that's a process that's much less about Paris and what happens in Paris and much more about what you're doing in your countries and what we can do in support of those programs. And I would note here, and perhaps obliquely as a reference to what happened in the United States the day before, I don't think things change that much. Currently, 70% of Americans think climate change is a serious problem. If we take a look at the dynamics and the polling, Americans think that the forests are a central part of our own culture. We think about some of the most ravaging consequences in our own forestry sector with forest fires in the West, and we then project that and look at our neighbors in Canada, which the secretary mentioned, but look at issues in Brazil, look at the consequences in Africa, look at what's going on in Indonesia. These are things that have a resonance to people at home. My own thinking is that independent of what happens in the election, these forest questions are likely to stay in our domestic consciousness and probably in our willingness to engage at a global level. Well, that's certainly reassuring. <laughs> okay, Joanna, I want to come back to you and also continue on this theme about Paris. Um, indigenous peoples were quite a visible presence in Paris, and I think we're very successful in making the case uh, within the halls of the negotiations, but also broadly in the media, that implementation, well, protection of the climate, but specifically implementation of Red Plus, will not be possible without recognizing the rights and roles of indigenous peoples. 
So, um, you're, and I also note that at our voting exercise uh, earlier, you know, we were looking at, at risks and opportunities, but overwhelmingly people really saw Red Plus as an opportunity to, to mm -hmm. ex exactly, you know, ad advance those rights. So I guess I'd like you to, to um, look ahead for us and say what, from your perspective, are the key priorities for indigenous peoples and incorporating their rights in, in Red Plus in the broader context that Jonathan has just described. And be specific about what your expectations are from governments such as the one represented by uh, Minister Trotman, such as the one represented by Jonathan Pershing, um, but also for more broadly from the international community. Bem, é, Red Mais por si só, ele não garante é, direitos. É, é preciso que esse reconhecimento dos direitos, essas garantias efetivas, né, elas sejam uma pré-condição ao Red Mais. É, eu vejo que tem que ter mecanismos, políticas, para que os povos indígenas façam suas ações de gestão autônoma em seus territórios, né, a partir dos seus próprios planos de bem viver, né, o plano de vida. No Brasil, por exemplo, nós temos o PENEGAT, que é a Política Nacional de Gestão Ambiental e Territorial Indígena. Né? Ela, ela depende, digamos assim, de uma colaboração do Fundo Amazônico. E, só que é, esse, o fundo né, ele apoia os projetos né, para a implementação, mas ainda depende, digamos, de instituições intermediárias, é, porque as organizações indígenas elas não conseguem acessar diretamente, digamos assim, o, o fundo. Né? Isso depende muito é, para que ele possa ter uma gestão autônoma em cima do seus territórios, uma gestão autônoma direto. É, as organizações indígenas têm um exemplo hoje né, da própria experiência né, que recebe apoio de fundo gerido pela Embaixada da Noruega, né, que é um apoio que serve é, de modelo, digamos assim, para os povos indígenas, de um apoio direto, longo prazo, e apoia o fortalecimento das organizações indígenas. Né? A minha expectativa, digamos assim, ao, a Paris, né, ao Acordo de Paris, é que a, os territórios indígenas, eles, já está surgindo essa visão, ontem eu cheguei no finalzinho da plenária, mas eu também ouvi uns comentários e que a reação foi positiva digamos assim, de algumas lideranças indígenas que estão presentes aqui. Né? Tem o pessoal da Amazônia, o pessoal da África, da Ásia, né? que a gente tem sempre visto isso e eu acho que a, a visão em relação aos povos indígenas está um pouco tá avançando, a partir do reconhecimento que os povos indígenas contribuem né? Mas também agora, ontem, eu vi um posicionamento de, é, da mesa de ontem falando que os territórios indígenas também têm que ser considerados como investimento. Então, essa palavrinha, investimento, muda um pouquinho no sentido, né? e a minha perspectiva é que os territórios eles estejam nessa linha né? da colaboração, contribuição, digamos assim, como estratégia do, da redução, do desmatamento, da degradação ambiental, para que se haja um cumprimento das metas. Né? Eu vejo assim, é, em relação ao Brasil, né, eu espero que com essas novas é, perspectivas, digamos assim, o Brasil ele também possa rever um pouquinho as suas metas. Eu, a gente fica muito preocupado quando fala de desmatamento zero, somente agir depois de 2030, né? como se houvesse um ponto de partida para combater a ilegalidade. Né? Então a gente espera que reveja um pouco essa meta para justamente não esperar até 2030 para agir. Mas a partir de ontem, né? porque é, os povos indígenas estão vulneráveis, os territórios estão vulneráveis e a gente precisa mudar esse quadro. Né? Então vamos mudar um pouco esse sentido de combater a ilegalidade e também de proteger né? a partir de inclusão desses planos de gestão da terra, de acesso direto às organizações indígenas e ver mecanismos para que o, os próprios povos indígenas possam também ter uma gestão autônoma do seu território. Eu acho que as metas cada vez mais é, em relação ao Acordo de Paris estão, é, digamos assim, ultrapassadas, não, não digamos ultrapassadas, mas também defasadas, né? digamos assim, que surgem Há uma necessidade de ter novas metas, 
né? e isso sirva de lição também para os países, né? para, digamos assim, seguir um pouquinho o modelo uh, da Noruega, né? que eu sempre, quando vejo no discurso, tem uma postura de apoiar os povos indígenas, seja ele no discurso de proteção de direitos, território, mas também de financiamento, né? que possa servir também para encorajar os outros países a também apoiar esses programas né, de, de proteção aos territórios indígenas como uma estratégia internacional e nacional ao combate ao desmatamento e à redução agroambiental, que são metas do Red Mais. Thank you. It's very clear. I think uh, she had some very clear directions for uh, governments of both uh, Red Plus countries and, and, and donor governments. So, Lars, I think you're going to get the last word here. Um, and I'm going to ask you to, to talk a little bit about two things. Um, one is that the Rainforest Foundation Norway, I think, is, is appropriately well respected for having um, a very strong you know, network of partnerships with organizations of indigenous groups in a number of uh, forest-rich countries. And just based on that uh, position, I'd invite you to comment any further on the, the points that uh, Joania has just made about what's next on the agenda, you know, nationally and internationally, that you, you, you bring um, from that network. But the other thing that I've been very impressed by of, of Rainforest Foundation Norway is how effectively you've also applied pressure to your own government to do things domestically. And so, you know, the, the work, the, the fact that the Norwegian pension fund, you know, divested from palm oil companies that, you know, were not uh, abiding by good standards and um, recent announcements, I don't know how many, how much your fingerprints are on them, but about getting deforestation out of, you know, procurement at the national level and all those good things. Um, any, any comment you'd like to make on how you did that and how others who may be interested in uh, lobbying their own governments for similar changes um, might uh, benefit from your experience? First, the... Um our model of working is not to establish Rainforest Foundation around the world, but to work with local uh, indigenous, environmental, rights-based organizations, work with them long-term, uh, provide core funding, uh, provide capacity building, make them strong. There's only one disadvantage. We are not visible for fundraising. But for the rest in sustainability, it's the right model. And there are too many organizations and too much utilitarian use of local groups. You can hire them for a specific task, for a restricted period. You can pay somebody, you can recruit somebody, but you don't build a strong civil society, you don't build strong indigenous movements, and you need to do that. Because the long-term sustainability of what we are talking about depends on that. Also, Norway has uh, provided since Bali large-scale funding for protection, but uh, we also had even more powerful actors uh, investing in what could be called investing in destruction or profits. So the pension fund Global, for instance, had billions invested in high-risk activities, and it's been one of our tasks to highlight that, to show uh, that this is not consistent, and to gain popular and political support for that this need to change. And the very important change is going on with uh, the biggest sovereign wealth fund on earth, the uh, pension fund global, is actually that now they are expecting in writing from all the 8,000 companies they invest in that A, they don't contribute to tropical deforestation, and B, they have recently also announced they shall not contribute to human rights violations, and they will have to find mechanisms of being public about that, not only those who are active in a forest area or in a controversial area, but even for their whole supply chains. It's about consistency in approach. It's about making uh, the left hand support what your right hand does or vice versa. And it is fundamentally important that we see these things together uh, and uh, there has been some great improvements, actually, in the Norwegian policy over the last years. Great. Well, the, uh, <laughs> yes, we congratulate the Norwegian government. So the uh, countdown clock is flashing red at us up here, so I'm afraid we have to bring this interesting discussion to a close. 
Um, let me uh, invite you to join me in expressing appreciation for all of our panelists and their great contributions uh, to this panel. Thank you. Thank you.